So, uh, so thank you everyone uh, for joining. Uh, so my name is Sudeep. Um, uh, I've been working in the industry for the past uh, yeah, 20, 23 years. Worked in semiconductor companies primarily, uh, but uh, uh, as part of uh, an employee and an, as, as an engineer in these companies, I've, I was fortunate to work on a uh, lot of technologies around wireless, embedded systems, uh, multimedia, and, uh, and, and quite recently, you know, dabbling a bit with FPGAs. Uh, life has always been very exciting uh, uh, as an engineer, and, uh, and I think uh, it's indeed uh, you know, wonderful to be an engineer. And also today, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, some of the great stuff that engineers have done to solve some of the problems uh, around digital communications. Uh, so that's why you see this title, Life of a Bit. <laughs> I will, uh, it's, yeah, the title sounds a bit catchy because there are a couple of movies like that, Life of Pi and all that. Uh, well, there is also some other reasons which I will talk about why I gave this title, uh, Life of a Bit. I'll come to that towards the end. But in this presentation, um, yeah, I would, I hope, uh, you will find it interesting and i think uh, this presentation is also not just for seasoned engineers uh, it's also for those students and college grads who who would be aspiring to become engineers uh, and enter the engineering world so uh, it's more uh, kind of covering some of the fundamentals around that and hope they will enjoy this so um so just before I start, yeah, this presentation is based on studies and views of my own, uh, does not represent the organizations I work for or part of. And uh, since uh, I had to use some of the images from the web uh, to kind of illustrate some of these topics. So uh, thanks to all those who have created those images and I've given due credit to them uh, in this presentation. Before I start, um, I just found this quote uh, fascinating. Uh, yeah, engineering is magic, or at least it is the closest thing to magic that exists in the real world. Uh, yeah, I think Elon Musk himself <laughs> is a magician in himself, the kind of things he's doing. Uh, but I think, yeah, he is a real core engineer. And, and, and I think uh, sometimes I really think the things which engineers have created so far is is really magical uh, if you take a go back a few years and see how we have advanced from where we were we were 100 years ago to what we are today uh, it's nothing short of magic right so i think this quote kind of resonates a lot with me and i i'm sure it does with a lot of you as well uh, so i thought i'd just start with this uh, before we get down into the slides um, okay, maybe I will just turn off the camera so that it, it we save some bandwidth. It's an age of sustainability and all of that. So let's save some bandwidth as well. So yeah, let I'll turn on the camera when, when we have, want to have a discussion. So uh, talking about life of a bit, this particular talk is more a story. I mean, it's not going to be technical, deep technical, uh, yeah, but it's more about connecting the some of the great work which engineers have put together. It's I call it the musings of a bit during his journey across the seas. Uh, it's basically a conversation, right? It's I've tried to make it like a story where it's a conversation between a bit uh, who wants to do something and and how an engineer comes in and tries to solve the problems and challenges in its path. Of course, uh, uh, this is like you know, looking at things in retrospective. So obviously some of those things or so problems were solved over a large period of time, but I'm just kind of bringing things together and say, hey, you know, you know, let's just, just take a look at what all things people have done uh, to make that use case possible. So it's all about engineers and engineering marvels. And I think this talk, uh, even though I'll be just covering very basic stuff, uh, but I, the intention is to inspire the next generation engineers, right? Uh, well, we are in the age of 
yeah artificial intelligence we see a lot of buzz there you know ai has been there for some time but it's now that we are seeing you know tremendous momentum around it but at the same same time we are hearing a lot about quantum computing and you know you know yeah, it's 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 complex you know we were in a similar kind of state maybe 25 years ago when ai was talked about uh, but now look at it ai is made is making such big strides today quantum computing is something similar i know people have been working on this for the past 20 25 years it still puzzles me i don't understand it at all whenever i read it but things are happening right and you never know that's perhaps something which we uh, as engineers should keep an eye on and what i would like to cover is is try to stimulate i mean using the life of a bit because everything in the digital world is designed using you know bit as the fundamental thing uh, let's you know as we go through the slides uh, keep thinking what if what if it was a qubit qubit is around quantum bit right what if it was a qubit how would things be designed and what what would be what would we need what kind of tools what kind of systems need to be built around it uh, how do we transition are we going to transition into a world where everything is going to be only based on qubits or is it going to be a combination of bits and qubits uh, what are the tools and use cases we need and and of course most important thing how do we build the expertise in that and when we say expertise is just not software it's not just about tool building not about hardware design it's not about circuit design it's about semiconductor physics it's it goes cuts across everything right mm -hmm. and and then and of course applications <laughs> as well so uh, with that uh, let's just start with bit so this whole story is just uh, about bit um, so uh, some fun facts uh, the word bit originated from the word binary digit uh, basically you know a shortened form of binary digit they took the b and it uh, it was invented by uh, a mathematician named john turkey uh, he's very famous uh, he's kind of one of the key mathematicians who kind of spent a lot of time uh developing the fast fourier transforms he's one of the guys who has even coined the word software you know so really really a, a great uh, mathematician uh, who has contributed so far and and then we have uh the term bit was actually officially used first by shannon uh, the guru in the communications world in his paper a mathematical theory of communication so where uh, he had to use something to measure something called information right in the past we had you can measure distance with meters you can measure weight with kgs but he realized hey i have something called information i need to measure it i need to figure out how fast i can send it you know meters per second i need to figure out how i can send some information uh, at a specific rate and that's when he brought about this word bit interestingly bit had two other names in the beginning and it's it's i don't know if some of you are familiar with it but but one was binit uh, they took the bin from the first word and then they took the it from the second word from the digit and they call it binit and any guesses what the second word would be second name would have been it's bigit <laughs> they took the bi from the first one and then they, they took the git from the second one and they got it bigit thankfully i think bit is more more nicer to hear and uh, <laughs> and it feels uh, it kind of resonates well because at the end of the day it's a bit so here's i go into a conversation style sorry it may sound a little kiddish but you know i just like it like it to be this way so that it kind of appeals to uh, any any person of any generation uh, so the a bit asks who am i who do i represent right well bit is fundamentally a unit of information right and it is used in digital computing for storage computing and is also used in communication systems uh, it has two values 0 and 1 0 or 1 and it can be used to represent multiple things just a 0 and 1 imagine right it can in, it can represent text numbers images videos you name it right it's the scale of that small little thing has exploded exponentially 
then the next question is okay where, where am i well yeah you you need bit to measure the size of the information you need to use it to measure the size of a data uh, how many bits of data am i am i storing how many bits of data is how many bytes of data of course you have bytes and bits as we go along you also want to use it to measure the rate of data transfer right if you're when you're transferring bits over a line you want to know the bandwidth that 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 particular line supports or when you're sending it how fast am i sending the data bits per second kilobits per second and then of course bits are also used for representing images like bitmaps graphics videos so this is where i'm just telling okay this is where you're going to be used but then the new kid in the town qubits right so bit is the smallest unit in classical computing right it's zero or one qubit it comes from the word quantum bit Okay, so uh, I think there's only one short they tried is Q-U-B-I-T. They didn't have any other short forms like quant bit or <laughs> or cub qubit or something a different one, but they just have one called qubit. Uh, seems like it's uh, widely accepted by everybody for now, um, and it is basically exists as a superposition of zero and one states simultaneously, which means that can be a zero or it can be one at the same time. I mean, it, it's very hard to understand it. I am also still struggling to understand it. <laughs> but but when you go down to uh, uh, deep physics, it's it's possible. And it and then the good thing about it, it's kind of correlates with mathematics. It's all about probability. Uh, so if we if we understand a little bit of the probability angle and try to look at a bit being able to represent zero and one at the same time from a probability angle perspective, then things start to make sense a little. I'm not, I'm, so I'm not saying that it's not saying that it is very clear, but it, yeah, you may kind of think, okay, 60% uh, of the time it's zero, 40% uh, of the time it's one or the other way around. And that's good information. And based on information, I can do things because a lot of the communication theory is all based on probability, right? So now you're just bringing that that thing all the way down to a bit or a, to, to a qubit. It also has a property called entangled. Somehow I find it, you know, uh, uh, very complex to understand this. But yeah, the existence of one qubit is dependent based on the another qubit which is nearby. Uh, at the same time, it's it's it can also tell us you can also tell what the value of the other is based on the value what one qubit has you can kind of say the value of the other qubit could be that you know so there is some good correlation there so there is a little bit of an entangling when qubits come together overall at the fundamental at, at the use case level right of course this is all deep level physics and stuff and then there is the hardware piece which comes in but then at, at a super high thousand feet above okay what are we getting out of this we are able to re represent more data in one qubit so which means in a bit if you could just represent a zero or a one but in a qubit you can represent both zero and a one right so it becomes two times so basically if there are n qubits you can with n qubits you can represent two to the power of n bits and at the same time you can process a lot more information uh, because of being able to store uh, more data so let's keep that at the back of our mind uh, as we uh, go through this presentation i may not be going into the technical details of qubit i i'm i'm sorry if you were <laughs> hoping that i would be going doing a deep dive on this uh, but perhaps we should and i think this whole presentation is for us to uh, at least to encourage anybody who's new to start exploring this. Uh, I know there's so much of material out there, uh, but hopefully this talk will also stimulate uh, things for those who are not familiar with this. So when it comes to transitioning from bits to qubits, this, it's going to be a paradigm change, right? It, you need to not, it's not just about the software layers, it's not just about compilers. It's It can touch every aspect, just like how we move from analog to digital. I think it's going to touch, it's going to be something similar. It's going to touch, deep physics, how hardwares are designed using the physics principles, 
how program how are we going to be programming stuff based on the knowledge that we are going to be able to store information not as one and zero but able to store information as one zero or even both <laughs> uh, how algorithms are going to be designed given that uh, yeah, it's going to be super fast what kind of error correction methods we need because it's all about probability so you know hey we, we have good we have good compute but at the same time there's a probability angle can we use some great error correction algorithms to solve some of those gaps what are the use cases can qubits be used everywhere is it an overkill in some cases maybe bits is sufficient so let's keep thinking about this as we look at the journey of a bit right i'm sorry it may be a very fundamental presentation about a bit but at at every stage what i would encourage all of you is that okay if if you had a qubit which is doing this task how would we do it differently what would we need so so let's uh, as we look at the life of a bit uh, let us admire the engineering marvels uh, of all the engineers uh, you know who have contributed uh, i'll be taking a simple example of a video call uh, i i thought uh, that would be something very simplistic and stimulate our brain to think of what would be the case if a qubit is used what will change what benefits will we get what do we need to do design differently what tools do we need what challenges does it bring and so on and so forth i don't have answers to these in this presentation but you know it's all just to stimulate a conversation and thinking so to 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 kind of start on this life of a bit uh, who is one of the characters in the story and the other character is the engineer uh, i'm going to take an example of a video call about a bit who wants to travel from san francisco from bangalore to san francisco which is 14000 kilometers away and the criteria is if you don't reach there in less than 200 milliseconds you know the user experience is going to be bad come up come and find a way to get there in less than 200 milliseconds that's the challenge the engineers were given so then let's look at what are the stages that a bit goes through in his journey right okay bit has to be born somewhere it it's not that it exists it has to there has to be a source of the bit then there has to be some computation that needs to be done on that bit uh, then somebody has to transport it over the seas across oceans and land and it has to reach its destination if i try to take an analogy with you know it's always good to uh, take it as an as an analogy sometimes people say you know i, I remember reading this in arvin's book as well Uh, sometimes you need to be a philosopher to uh, to kind of break down that problem statement to find solutions but here i'm not 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 being philosophical but i'm just taking an analogy of a bus journey right I, i'm starting from home uh, i need to pack my stuff i need to find the right bus i need to book a seat to go there i need to head to the boarding station and find the right bus i need to figure out which bus it is going there and then enjoy that experience of sitting in that bumpy bus journey and with a lot of traffic lights and stuff like that and get get to the other end i may have to go through multiple bus stations where other people jump in some people jump off and at the end of the day at 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 the end of the journey i get off the bus i get back my take my luggages and and then spend the rest of the day enjoying the destination so that's the journey uh, 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 we have as an individual and that's the journey which a bit is going to have in its in its 14000 km journey which i'm going to talk about but before we go there about the journey i think we need to see how bit has people have tried the engineers have tried to store the bit because in its journey it's it it gets stored at different places and and engineers have tried to store this in various ways starting with charles babbage in his first computer or what do you call it uh he called it the analytical machine and the analytical engine where the bit was something like a lever you know a lever which is pushed up or down you know yeah that's that's setting setting the setting set giving you an indication whether it is on or off or you know a, a level a or level b or something like that 
then somewhere along the way we had paper i remember my dad bringing this when he was working in hal uh, yeah, at that time hal was one of those few companies where they had computers and he used to bring these uh, he used to show me those paper strips with a lot of dots a lot of holes in them and i used to wonder, well, what are these i mean these are yeah they are storing information it's a hole a no hole that's a bit we had magnetic disks polarity of the matter we had optical disks whether the light is getting reflected or not then we had the memories where it's based on capacitors or stuff or even transistors where uh, depending on ddr or srams right whether it is positive charge or negative charge it is ddrs or if it is rams it can be latches or flip flops and then of course we have digital circuits where uh, you can store that based on voltage levels but then uh, even though we store these bits we need to even handle these bits because at the end of the day it's not just about storage it's also about computing because it you you we, i talked about storage but there is computing and then there's transporting so I'm, when it comes to computing uh just having a zero or one on a piece of paper or a zero or one on a, on a capacitor isn't enough we need to start doing something magical with it and that's when uh the engineers you know came up with fantastic technologies like transistors bipolar junction transistors field effect transistors uh all of these are some some form of switches right even a ram it's some form of a capacitor or something like that which is basically uh helping you to store information as compute is being done uh, uh i have a nice uh, uh gif which i stole from uh, wikipedia which is you know it shows a simple uh, ic where you have a gate level high and low uh setting the voltage of the collector uh whether it's high or low so using a small voltage or a small current you can control the voltage level uh, at a different point and in this way you it's kind of turning on and turning off the switch and and this was fundamental right once people started building these magical transistors and of course you know the moore's law and all that but but at the start it was just a single transistor and then people said hey with these transistors i can put a few transistors together and i can build uh, a carno map i can build uh, an and table i can build uh, a not gate i can build a nor gate and then people started building gates then people started building flip flops latches and that there comes the world of registers right you can store a register in a registers you can store a lot of bits in a bunch of uh, flip flops which are all connected together or a set of latches connected to the other flip flops are typically clock clocked and latches are typically asynchronous and hey you have a way to uh, you know push in data push out data store data for temporary processing and and there starts the world of digital circuits people started building general purpose computer processors and then fixed function ips memory controllers i2c controllers you name it right and now you have fixed function gpus and with millions and billions of transistors which is all at the end of the day uh, just handling bit patterns and 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 computing them so this is how we know the basic how a bit is handled in the digital world but then we need to cover a distance right i am taking the example of a black dot a black dot i am taking a small little pixel out there a black dot on a white piece of paper uh i need to transfer this particular black dot to san francisco from bangalore to san francisco and i need to cross oceans and of course one of the biggest path in the whole thing is the, the internet right and when you say internet yeah it's talking about cloud data centers terrestrial undersea cables routers and all of that uh, designed by engineers using principles of semiconductor technologies leveraging software and at the end of the day all about handling bits it they also need they needed mobile networks right so we needed a way to send the data over a wireless channel so people came up with you know 
standards to define how core networks work, how the radio access network works, what kind of telecom protocols we need to make sure we use the shared medium. And then we had the world of the application engine. How do you capture the image? How do you encode it? How do you process it? And how do you transport it? And at the same time, how do you send it over a wireless thing? We have this world of modems, which is the data link protocols, the baseband, and the RF and the antennas, right? So in this presentation, I'm going to actually go through this particular journey. I know it's very basic, very fundamental, but as we go through this, uh, yeah, while we appreciate uh, the great work which engineers have done, let's keep thinking that, okay, if it is not a semiconductor PNT transistor, if it is not a MOSFET, if it is a qubit, okay, what, what are we going to be doing differently, right, at, at every level? Uh, but since I'm talking about uh, a qubit, which is, uh, oh, sorry, talking about a bit which is making this journey, uh, I'm only going to look at it from the perspective of that bit uh, who is coming out of that uh, black dot. But, you know, for that bit to cross the oceans, uh, there are other things which have to happen. So I'm just saying this. So let's assume that the application is launched, a video call is established, there is a path which has been negotiated based on the codec and what type of call. So, you know, some other bits are doing this job. Um, then there is a transport link which has been established, or let's say a 5G link with a PDP, PDN connection established uh, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the network. And then there's a video camera which is on and which is focused on the black dot. And the black dot says, hey, how do I reach Silicon Valley, which is San Francisco, which is basically this is the black dot on the white paper. And then the engineer says, hey, you need to get into a form that is transportable, right? Okay, you are, you are an analog piece of data, right? You need to, you need to get into a form which can be sent across. I can't, I can't send you within this form all the way 14 kilo, 14,000 kilometers away. If you are nearby, yes, I can just show the black paper to a guy standing nearby and he can see it thanks to light and he gets to see that black dot. But no, I can't do that. You need to, you need to be converted into a new form. Here we are going to be use bit. Maybe in future people would use qubit, but we'll see. So that's when somebody came up and designed something called the digital camera. A, the, one of the first few digital, I mean, I know the NASA and all, they had worked on camera technologies in the past. Uh, I think even before that, we had some video tape recorders and stuff like that. But, but let's look at digital camera because I'm talking about a video call here, right? So let's start with video call. And in a video call, we, we have something called a digital camera. And the first digital camera was created by a guy called Steve Sanson. And I was just reading about it. He is a guy, you know, when he was working at Kodak, he took some spare parts of some other analog cameras and took some digital circuitry and he just put this together, right? And he said, hey, here, I can make a 0 0.01 megapixels image camera, which is a black and white camera. And this is the kind of one of the first few digital cameras which was made. And I think later on, Sony came up with something and started you know, scaling it up. But look at where we are today. Uh, today, we are talking about multi cameras, 20 megapixel, you know, four or five cameras, <laughs> you name it, it's, it's exploded. And it's all a lot of engineering effort with great engineers coming together and stretching the limits of imagination uh, and bringing things together for us. So then the question comes, the bit asks, you know, I would like to represent my color in bits, but how do I do that? And of course, we need to extract the color from the photons and represent them as bits. And that's where the bit is born, right? You have these, there's a nice way uh, on the camera where photons which hit, hit that pixel, you have a multi-pixel camera sensor, gets converted into electrons and varying gradients of grayscale or RGB colors. And, and that's how bits are formed. And of course, if it's a video call, for every frame, the, it's not just one bit. The bits is going to have, I'm calling them brothers and sisters, <laughs> trying to give it a human touch here, is uh, lots and lots of brothers and sisters of this bit is generated. Right. Let's take an example of a 1080p pixel camera running at 60 frames per second. 
with a, with a very high resolution cam color camera, which 24 bit camera, how many sisters or brothers is he having along with him at that time? Uh, it's 1080p into 1920. That's the kind of uh, aspect ratio times 24 into 60. That's two gigabits per second, right? That's the kind of data which we are generating from some of the uh, cameras today we have. Two gigabits per second, right? Then the question is, hey, I have so much, so much of data, right? Can I send two gigabits? I mean, we talked about a camera which is uh, in a 0 0.01 megapixels when it was invented. Now you're talking about uh, two gigabits per second. How do I send these across from the camera? Is there enough space? Uh, yeah, to kind of in that in the channel, is there in so much space in the air channels to send this? No, the engineer says, no, you can't. You need to be squeezed in a bit. And then the question comes, am I going to lose any color when I when I get squeezed? Am I going is my am I going to look different? And the great engineers of our times, they have lossy compressions. They have lossless compressions, right? Like JPEG and all are kind of compression techniques, which are lo lossy type, but still OK. You still don't, from, from a human eye perspective, you get the same experience, and, and the image is drastically reduced in size. But then he says that for, for you to be able to compress, be compressed, you need to head to the mothership. That is the, the processor, right? You need to get there first. And that's when. A lot of, I mean, this has evolved over time, but I'm just taking what is there today. We have great standards like the MIPI standards, right? We have standards for camera. They call it the CSI standard, the camera serial interface standard, MIPI CSI standard, which can support up to 2.5 gigabits per second. They have a link layer and a transport layer to be able to send data as as fast as 2.5 gigabits per second. I think CSI 2, CSI 3 is all coming. We have we have a mechanism as shown in this picture here from the cameras using these standard CSI protocols and using high speed phi transceivers, you can achieve 2.5 gig or even more. Like USB is like USB 3.1, 3.2 is 10 gigabits per second. You have transceivers which are you know having a single lane itself can go as high as 10 gigabits per second. And you are able to now send that whole raw data to the processor, uh, the host processor, we call it application processor, through these standards. Uh, there's a standard for camera, we call it the CSI standard. There's a standard for display when you want to output it, you call it the DSI standard. Uh, Arvind, just a question. Are you able to see my pointer by any chance? Uh, this pointer when I show it? Yeah, yeah, I can see the pointer. Okay. But the slides are truncated on top and bottom. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so see if you can correct that. Let me see if I can correct that. Uh, that's strange. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, OK, let me At least let my me display is like that. I don't know about others. My display, I see it like that. Yeah, even mine is like that, Darwin. The top and bottom. Oh, is cut off, OK, yeah. let me let me just stop sharing and share it again. Sorry about it. I will what I'll do is I'll share the whole entire screen. Maybe that may help. Sorry about it. Is it better now? Uh, yeah. Oh, OK. I think yeah, that's a good catch. We, we need to tell the guys, so we need to tell uh, Microsoft and Google about it. So when I did tab share, uh, I think it was doing some truncation. That's interesting. Uh, OK, um, so 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 uh, so we have uh, several standards like this. And then the MIPI body is building standards for the RF interface, for the DAX, the ADCs. There is something for the analog interface, RF front end for the analog ICs. We have Soundwire for the audio codecs. We have uh, Unipro and all that. I'm not very familiar with some, but some of these are JDEC standards for the storage. There is I3C. All these are great work done by engineers and standards force coming together to solve real problems and in this case all about how do you get you know, 1080p megapixel camera data into the host 
Now comes the next part. Okay, you you need to get it to the host. I, we have a protocol. We have a CSI protocol, but you know I can't tell the processor to copy data at 2.5 gigabits per second and copy it into the RAM. Neither can it handle that data straight away. So it it needs somebody in between, and that's when the direct memory access, the DMA engine, comes in. The DMA DMA engine picks the data, the, the CPU, the through software instructions tells the DMA, oh, can you please pick the data coming through this BPCSI interface and copy it into a region memory address, which I provide to you. And, and then the DMA engine does the job. So the bit goes through the CSI interface, uh, goes through the buffers of or, or, the, or the queues of the DMAs and ends up in the in the in the LPDDR or the DDR connected uh, to the to the memory, so to the to the system. And then uh, comes the next challenge, right? We need this data to be compressed, and yes, we have uh, a lot of innovation there too. We call it encoding. So thanks to the world of encoding standards, uh, I think from starting from the 1990s, I, we have the H.261, then MPEG-1, MPEG-2, at least when I graduated uh, 20 years ago, I was introduced to MPEG-4, you know, MP3, AAC, these were all uh, the hot standards those days. But things have come a long way, we have, so many standards, VP8, VP9, now we have H.265 and so many of them. And these are all, yeah, ways to kind of be able to compress, you know, every frame using smart techniques uh, out there, uh, using in the frequency domain uh, and also using information like what is what is kind of relevant for the user, particularly when it comes to audio, which which bands, which frequencies can I hear here, and a lot of smart techniques out there used to do the encoding. And the whole the bit which we talked about goes through this process. And then comes the aha moment. Okay, what if you use qubits for camera processing? Now, when you talk about camera, I, I talked about a scenario where you're taking the image coming, um, you know this particular data coming in straight from the camera into the processor. But technically speaking, you have something called ISPs, image signal processing uh, uh, engines in, in, in the hardware, because there's a lot of uh, algorithms that need to go in because uh, not every camera sensors are the same. There are some algorithms that are needed for tuning the camera, color correction, noise reduction, white balance, gamma correction, really, really complex stuff. And, and imagine now that if, if all of this was being done using qubits, right, then we are talking about, yeah, we need uh, uh, an SDK for qubit. Do we have an SDK for qubit programming? Do we have a qubit programming language? Is there a new programming paradigm which kind of abstracts away certain things for us so that we can leverage the high computation and parallelism possible? Will my JPEG algorithm or will my H.265 have to be rewritten in a different way or do I need to have design new algorithms which to leverage uh, you know, the fact that I'm able to do more parallel stuff? Uh, do I need to have new read-write protocols or additional error correction mechanisms because I'm dealing with qubits, right? So just a few thoughts for us to consider and I will go, we'll have similar thought all along the way. So then the quick question comes, right, now that we have standards, the question is, okay, I have some standard, you tell me you have a standard, but who does the compression? And that's where software comes in, right? So we have today, uh, you know, fantastic uh, advancements in the area of microcontrollers, microprocessors, uh, you know, getting into small designs like mobile phones. Imagine, right? I mean, where we are today compared to 20 years ago, such sophisticated processors which have GPUs, integrated GPUs, integrated uh, 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 VPUs, uh, even AI blocks now uh, integrated doing some TensorFlow uh, math and all of that. 
all of that getting integrated. And this particular bit, the, our little friend bit, which is, which, is just, which is in the memory, goes through a lot of more transfers from the memory into the CPU, which has a lot of Mac blocks, a lot of tensor blocks, a lot of additions of software operations, all controlled by software with operating system support and all of it, you name it. I think all of you are in this call must be quite familiar with all of this, the kind of infrastructure we have to enable all of that. And then from a hardware perspective, we have things like cache so that you don't want the bit for every time you want to access the bit, you don't want to go to the memory and take it. There's a lot of latency in getting that bit. So you, you store it in a cache, which is some sort of an, uh, a fast uh, register, digital logic based uh, storage, which is faster for the processors to, to access. And this little friend of ours goes from the memory to the processors registers, to the cache, in some cases, he is sent across to the to the GPUs to do some fixed processing, fixed operations, brought back, and 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 all of it at the end of the day to just compress it from from that large form to what what we want to, so that we can send it over the air interface, and that's the process we call encoding. So now that so we have Sudeep, everything, yes. Yes, Sudeep, I just want to have. I I, I know you are meaning this, but I just want to confirm. Right. Uh, is it the bit which is going transformation or it is a group of bits which is being you know referred here it is a group of bits and actually the bits is already and uh, once it's encoded it's not the same uh, bit but it's actually yes it's all about a group of bits yeah but i'm just and putting it on the i yeah. got it yeah uh, yeah i think uh, thank you i just wanted to make sure and then finally even if it is after you know in any form again it is again bits only right only the yes size of number of a group of bits are reduced. Exactly. So, so yes, I have I have kind of uh, given a human touch to a specific bit, <laughs> let's say bit A, but you're right. As it goes through from one, uh, that particular bit goes to the RAM and then it goes through this encoding process, you know, yeah, it's not the same bit. It's, 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 it's getting transformed into an encoded form. But I'm, what I'm saying that at the end of the day, that identity, which represents that color, is there in that family of bits, group of bits. He's in there somewhere. You're there somewhere. It's just that we can't pick you out because you have been transformed into a new, new entity. But you're there. It's it's out there in that particular package. Yeah, it's still a bit. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And then this particular bit, yeah, now it's kind of transformed. Uh, it's in the encoded state. Uh, it's become small. So he is uh, he's no more not with the same set of brothers and sisters he had. It's He's kind of compressed and he's kind of changed into a different form. But it's he's still there, that information. That, so now we should actually use the word information. That information is still there, but not exactly the same bit. But that information is still there. He's in the form of an information. Then he asks, are you ready to fly? Is, is there a process or an itinerary to follow? Can I, can I go off? But then the engineer says, sorry, you can't just go. There is a check-in process, right? Just like we have check-ins in airports. And that check-in process is called the OSI model. Yeah, we are we probably all of us have studied it, right? The whole idea of having a layered approach uh, is so important. If this was not done, uh, I think, a lot of the advancements wouldn't have happened as we would want today. Yes, there are certain limitations because of this layered approach. Sort of some optimizations are difficult because everybody tends to work in those layers and all of that. But nevertheless, uh, it's this layered approach which kind of brought in clarity on what should be done by each layer in terms of uh, functionality, right? Like in terms of packaging the data, in terms of creating a session, in terms of presenting the data, establishing a session from one computer to the other computer before it can be trans transferred across a session layer. Then the transport layer, which is the one which is the end-to-end -end connection and making sure you have an end-to-end -end connection. You have a network layer, which is basically that, that little bus which carries that bit across. So that the, that particular frame which says where it should be going to and from where it's coming. I will talk a little bit about them. The data link layer to make sure that as it may goes through that path, if anything happens to it, you know, don't worry. We will take care of it. We there is a, there is a link layer mechanism to 
help retransmit. So when you are sent, we'll make a copy of you and keep it so that if you anything happens there, we will resend, right? There's a lot of linked layer protocols. And then you have the physical layer. So we will just quickly go through. So the OSI, again, a marvel uh, made by engineers uh, with a lot of protocol stacks. On the right, I have given some examples, like an application layer, you have the HTTP presentation, you have some of, I think presentations also HTTP to some extent. So this sometimes these kind of layers kind of overlap each other. Sessions is all about sockets, transport layers about TCP, UDP, I will talk about it next. Network layer, data layer, and, phys and the physical layer. So then the question comes, okay, who's going to carry me and ensure that I don't get late, right? It's important, I, I have a bit, I have a time limit. I have to reach the other end in 200 milliseconds. If I don't reach in 200 milliseconds, the user experience is going to go bad. How am I going to ensure that? And yeah, good work by engineers. There are protocols, so many protocols, right? I mean, I know I've only listed a few here. Uh, you have RTCP, real-time control protocol. You have RTP, which is another real-time protocol. You have the codecs, which I talked about. You have the transport layer protocols, so UDP, TCP. Uh, now you're talking about uh, even quick and so many such protocols being defined, all trying to address various kinds of problems. And let's go a little bit deeper into some of these protocols, right? Uh, Fundamentally, when you say protocols and all, it's, it may sound confusing. At least when I was studying the communications theory, I used to get, you know, you know, kind of overwhelmed by all these terminologies of protocols and ports and stuff. And I always felt that, hey, could somebody simplify? Why do we need this layered mechanism? Why? What, what are they trying to achieve? So I'm going to take the example of bus stop to 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 uh, to just take to take, uh, make it simpler, right? So, so the bit asks, is there a bus stop to get on and get off? Is there a place where I know I should go so that I get onto that bus, uh, I go across? And that's what we call is the, the transport layer in oversight term. So we have something called ports. I like to call them as bus stops. I'm not really 100% sure if it's the right analogy, but let's let's take it for, for the sake of uh, conversation here, a, a bus stop, is something like a port. You have a you open a TCP port, and and I have a, a, a different kinds of ports. I have a port for FTP data. I have a port for TCP data. I can have a port for UDP. You have different kinds of ports that you can open, and I can send my data on that port, and I can have different kinds of protocols supported by that particular transport layer. So I can have something called the UDP protocol, user datagram protocol, or TCP protocol is a transport connection protocol. Both are different types. One is a connectionless, one is stateless, one is uh, not very reliable, but very useful for real time data. That is, you just send the data and you just hope it reaches the other end. If there's something happens to it on the way, sorry, I mean, yeah, uh, you, you, you need to deal with it. UDP is all about making sure you keep sending the data. And typically, most of the video call, audio call, all of them use UDP because you don't want. Uh, so much of retransmissions because when you by the time you do a retransmission you may be sometimes losing a lot of time in in that in that flow uh, tcp is all about um, you know flow control you get a sync act you send some data you have a timing window you send a bunch of data uh, if if the other end says hey i didn't receive it or you didn't get don't get an acknowledgement from the other end within the time window what do you do oh i will send another uh, I'll send it again. So now from a bus bus perspective, it's all about, I have to take a bus. <laughs> the bit has to take a bus. What the bit is going to do is if it is UDP, he is just going to get into that bus and go, right? And let's hope the bus reach, reaches the other end safely. If it, it has some problems on the way, okay, bad luck. Uh, you're lost. Uh, you know, so someone at the other end should know that this guy hasn't reached and try to figure out how you can recover from it. But if it is TCP, what we do is I create a copy of it, or uh, something of that sort, right? And then I send it across, and then I wait for an ACK within that transmission uh, window. And if I get that, great, I continue to send. Uh, then there's something called uh, a TCP sliding window algorithm, which works to make sure that you are optimizing the usage of the of the time. Uh, if you don't get that ACK uh, back within that time window, 
you you have a copy you send it across and this principle is used uh, at many layers uh, along the way but it's fundamentally the same now that you have a, a mechanism to send the data from one port to the other but but the port is not a, not the address it's 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 not it is it's just a it's something like a bus stop id right i have i am boarding bus stop id uh, 4 but it doesn't tell you whether it's bus, it is from a btm layout uh, or not we, you don't know that and you, and you don't know it has to go to bus stop number 10 uh, in san francisco right uh, so that's where you need to you need to know uh, which vehicle to board so you need to have uh, a way for you to board the right vehicle which says it is going to this particular destination and for that's where the network layer comes in so what does the network layer add it adds something called the ip address so now we are talking about the bit which is the encoded bit was part of a, a tcp or udp packet which means that when it got added it got it got some information about the port number right which port uh, it is coming from and it is going to and then you have a tcp package a header has been added now in top on top of that you need to tell uh, the network layer okay i'm sending it from this particular machine with an ip address so here the address is ip Uh, which we get to know through other mechanisms at the start, but we'll, we'll ignore that. Just assume that we have that uh, the address where it has to go to, and it attaches the destination address. And and as this particular packet goes all along the way, this particular identity of this packet remains everywhere. So that's what the network layer does. So network layer is adding the source and destination IP address to it. Then the question comes, okay, great, I'm on my way. How does the vehicle I move in, uh, how does this move, right? Okay, you have put me in a, in a bus, but uh, is it a bus which goes all by road till San Francisco or does it, does it go by sea, does it go by air? Uh, what does it do? And that's when the modern world comes in. Uh, I know there was a talk on, on some of the modern related topics uh, in one of the previous sessions. It's, it's one of the most fascinating worlds of, of, of wireless communication and wired communications, right? So we have something called modem. So what is modem? Yeah, modem, yeah, as we some of all of us probably know, it's modulator in a very simplistic way. It's all about modulating and demodulating because you need your digital bit, which you have packaged as part of your IP frame with an IP address, destination and source address. You cannot send that particular bit with TTL logic or whatever, you know, low level logic, uh, uh, signal voltage levels. It cannot travel the distance uh, over the seas. So you need to kind of modulate it. You need to kind of uh, send it on some sort of a carrier frequency so that it's a carrier for this particular bit. So you need to then first convert it to analog and then, then, then modulate it on a carrier. And then that carrier, high frequency carrier wave takes it across. So that's what we call modulation of the digital signal, converting into an analog, and then on the receiver end, demodulating. But wait. But it's not as simple as that, right? Um, you can't just modulate and send it across. Uh, unfortunately, the journey, as I, as, as I, as the bit asks, uh, there are thieves and accidents possible. On you can get stuck or lost. There are there are they traffic police? Is there are there traffic lights? You know, <laughs> on the way. I'm just trying to dramatize it a bit. Um, and that's where the world of modern protocols come in. We have, uh, uh, you know, the 3GPP standards, which defines most of the protocols for, for the for the uh, 5G, 4G, and stuff. And I will delve a little into it. So when it comes to wireless data link protocol, so we, as I said, we cross the network layer. Now we are going into the last two layers, which is the data link layer and and the baseband layer. So what does the data link layer do? And of course, there's a few things on top of the data link layer as well. Uh, is you have um, a lot of these headers, you know, uh, uh, these are all like plain text kind of information. Um, it, it, it makes sense to, since the bandwidth is precious, 
uh, there is a lot of room for compression. You can do something called header compression. You know, some of these packets which are coming for every packet which you get, you keep getting these headers, right? I mean, we as engineers, you know, some of the ways we design stuff is, okay, one of the sim simplest things, package it in a header. If I want to do IPsec, I encrypt it and I put a header. I add a key or something on top around it, right? You keep adding these headers. And these headers start building up. And somewhere you need to find smart ways to uh, compress some of these headers to save some bandwidth so there is the protocol has defined a standard way to compress those headers you also want to make sure that this particular data uh, is not uh, you know there it's, it's confidential is nobody can actually access that so there are some good encryption ciphering they call it ciphering algorithms implemented by the standards which do the encryption of this packet it's all then as part of that of the modem protocol stack and then once this is encrypted uh, when it goes to the other side you know it it decrypts it it does some integrity checks you know is it okay you know the usual stuff confidentiality integrities and accessibility you know the same stuff you know make sure that uh, nobody has tampered with that packet while it's going across the seas uh, there are traffic controllers so it's not just uh, the packet with the camera data which is going out of the device there are so many other things when you are browsing and stuff there are so many other packets which are coming along uh, from from the from the host uh, that needs to be sent and it's also not about just the data from the device there are so many other users that are kind of using that air interface medium right it's a it's a shared medium that is being used and of course if in some cases it goes through cables it's the shared cables and and there are traffic controllers and and for that we have something called control channels which are defined as part of uh, the standards to make sure that uh, these dedicated channels have uh, resources allocated to take it through and in the data link layer we have something called a radio link layer and a medium access layer these are all um, uh, layers which do some sort of mapping of the various logical channels so so when you have different particular data paths coming from from the host you can have different data connections maybe a browser connection maybe an mms connection maybe a teams call you know you can have different quality of service for that you have different logical channels there you could also have different logical channels within the modem for its own control uh, stuff you know when it wants to do handovers there's a lot of channels for that as well all these channels have to be multiplexed and sent over a medium and that's where we need a medium access control layer right somewhere you need to make sure that all of them fit in there's a good rate matching there is a right priority scheduling uh, of all of these and here again it's all about this bit getting into one of the uh, uh, one of the rlc layers some few RLC headers getting added to it, some CRC bits getting added to, for error checks, some forward direction error correction bits getting added to it. I will talk about forward error correction as well, why it is needed. And then at, and then getting scheduled at the right time transition time interval for it to find the right slot where it can go onto the air interface. All that kind of scheduling is all done in the data link layer. Now that we have this packet packaged in these uh, frames, uh, the bit asks, okay, I'm, I'm still one, but when I go through air, I become invisible, right? Uh, and there are so many of us, how do I ensure I don't go and knock onto others, right? And that's where the baseband layer protocols comes in and the baseband algorithms come in. Uh, yesterday, we had a, a very exciting talk about OFDM, uh, which, is, which, is, which is perhaps one of the most uh, greatest uh, advancements in wireless technology. But let me walk through some of that here. So when it comes to a, a packet of bits, right now you have a bit coming from the camera, which has been encoded, packaged into a TCP packet or a UDP packet, uh, a frame, uh, and then packaged into an IP frame, uh, then goes through some compressions of the headers, goes through some encryption of what we call it ciphering, and then that becomes part of a uh, radio link uh, layer where it adds uh, a few bits in front so that it kind of identifies 
or which logical channel it is and then gets mapped to the transport channels uh, at the medium access layer and the medium access layer then says that okay this particular packet uh, has to go at this time right it, it gets gets that go but then eventually it has to go on the air interface right it's still in bits before it's sent out, uh, there are a couple of things. Yeah, CRC, you know, it's it's all done, the usual CRC checks so that, you know, if something has happened to it, you want to know whether uh, some data has got corrupted, you have a CRC check-in check, so you can do a, a quick CRC attachment to it. You attach your CRC uh, header to that particular packet. And you also have something called forward error correction. This is a very very advanced topic uh, which perhaps is uh, needs a dedicated session in itself uh, we have technologies like ldpc turbo decoders you know you name it all that does is that it adds certain redundant bits based on these packets or based on this particular frame of data it adds certain redundant bits to that particular frame of data and it send it across the beauty of this redundant bits is that if at all a few bits are corrupted either in the data or in as part of some of the crc bits or whatever you can recover from that particular error using these extra bits which you have added and that's what we call uh, ldpc decoding or turbo decoding viterbi decoding so there are great algorithms which have been designed by the standards guys where you you add some redundant bits you send it across send it through a noisy channel uh, of course there's a limit of how much noise you can tolerate each of these algorithms can tolerate but there if a few bits goes haywire you get the bits based on that extra information you can recover the uh, the the real data so that's called uh, forward error correction encoding and then there is something called scrambling uh, scrambling is like you take a specific data and you spread it with a specific code you kind of multiply the set of bits with a specific code so that when you send that particular output to the other end you again multiply it with the same code and get the strongest signal out and you can get back the same data so you're kind of you're doing a, a code based scrambling to kind of single out each of the various channels uh, which you want to send so you can either even use it for specific users like cdma was based on code division multiplexing basically you're having unique codes for different users you kind of assign that code and that particular user's data was multiplied by that unique code and it is sent across on the other hand the same code is used to descramble the data and you extract out the data so that's called scrum scrambling process then you have something called modulation modulation is all about um, you kind of take your data and you you, you can have different voltage levels and different phase when you want to send your data. So if you if I were to take a BPSK, which is just ones and zeros, you can you can send a positive data or a negative data to represent one and zero. But let's say you want to have uh, more data to be sent as symbols, then you have modulation techniques like QAM, QPSK, and so on and so forth. All it does is it is varying levels of voltage levels, right? Different voltage levels and different phase angles. We call it IQ vectors. So you have different voltage and phase. And as a result of that, you can send more data at the same time using this technique. And that's called modulation. And the last thing, which is the magical thing of 5G, and of course, in the Wi-Fi world, it's been there for some time, is OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Here, you try to take advantage of orthogonality of frequency and time. And, and at the same time, or you use orthogonal frequencies to ensure that when you send data on one subcarrier, it doesn't impact the data on another subcarrier. That's what that's what they call it orthogonal frequencies. And then you can send data on different subcarriers at different time slots. So if you see in this diagram below, it's kind of a matrix here. You can send your data in one of these frequency time slots and you can allocate uh, so you're not only really just doing time division multiplexing, you're not just doing only frequency division multiplexing, but you're doing a mix of both. You're getting 
a slot in time and frequency to send your particular data and you're using sub carriers which are orthogonally spaced so this is uh, this is the part where the bit has now gone through um, uh, the a phase of the digital baseband it this it has its own frequency slot it has its own time slot and and i, I think bit is kind of saying it's so cool but it's come we have come a long way right i mean we used to have frequency division multiplexing we used to have tdma cdma now we are talking about ofdma and then when it comes to frequency bands right in gsm we had something called 900 gig, 900 megahertz bands these are all called sub 6 gigahertz bands in the in the 5g 5g terms these are all bands which are below 5 gigahertz but today we are talking about looking at frequencies beyond 6 gigahertz this is what we generally call the millimeter wave bands 26 gigahertz you know 54 you know you name it you're going to higher and higher frequency bands the advantage is that as you go to higher bands, you have a lot more free spectrum, a lot more, you can have larger channel bandwidths, so you can start pumping in, you know, start sending more and more data at higher bandwidths. But one of the drawbacks is that at higher frequencies, you know, the waves can get blocked by simple things. If you have a wall, it gets blocked. If there's a snowfall, the quality of the signal follow, falls. So then people have to come up with smart techniques. And that's the next part, uh, which I will quickly talk about. Uh, Arvind, um, am I running? I mean, I, I'll need another 10 minutes. Is it OK? Yeah, yeah, fine, yeah. OK, all right. I'll try to wrap it up in 10 minutes. So then the next question is, OK, I have got this data. Uh, is it am I going to reach San Francisco in one hop? No, it's it's not about it. It's, it's going to go through multiple layers. You have radio access networks. You have base stations. And today, the radio access network is going through a transformation. I don't know if you have heard about open RAN, disaggregated RAN, distributed RAN, your virtual RAN, you name it. There are so many things happening here because it's all of them are trying to optimize uh, costs when it comes to deploying uh, uh, cells because uh, as we especially as we go to higher frequencies uh, and especially when we have higher urban densities the sizes of the cells starts getting smaller and smaller and i imagine if you have smaller and smaller cells you're having more base stations and then you need to have more and more hardware and it's going to be very expensive and there's a, there's a, some very good interesting work happening around in the RAN space where they're talking about disaggregated architecture. But nevertheless, I think we will we'll just keep it simple for now. So this particular bit leaves the uh, device, gets onto the air, goes to the 5G RAN network, which is the base station. Some people call it uh, 5G, uh, G node B in the 5G world. It's called E node B in the 4G world, you know, uh, base stations in the, in the 2G world. It reaches there and then through cables go to the 5G core network and from the 5G core network goes to the internet and then, you know, and out there. It's, it's then just like any normal packet. So, but yeah. The fun fact is that, by the way, they ensure to give you a ticket which is billed to the sender. I mean, when you board a bus, you know, you can't travel free, you get a ticket. So there are billing mechanisms implemented in the 5G network so that every packet which is go, they measure you and then you are charged at the end of the day. So, so there are so many hope, hops and routes, right? Uh, on the device before you take off. But then there is something else we need to look at. So some of the engineering advances which people have brought about. We, we just talked about processors. We talked about uh, accelerators, memory. But all of this sit on PCBs, right? And today, these PCBs are not just simple PCBs. There are like four layer, eight layer PCBs. So when you're talking about sending a bit, you know, this little bit is actually going through tunnels, right? It's going from one layer to the other, right? Imagine, right? It's it's going crossing, going from one side of the boat to the other side of the boat. Uh, so we have this wonderful uh, innovation uh, happening in the PCB world of uh, multi-layer PCBs. And then the last part, right? Okay, you know, uh, it's gone through those PCBs. One of the most fascinating and perhaps the most complex thing uh, in today's world is electromagnetic theory. I mean, it's one of the subjects which I, I always read it and I still do. Uh, is the world of design of antennas, right? 
Now we have so many kinds of antennas today. I mean, the traditional dipole antenna where you have a, a high frequency wave which kind of goes on that particular, let's say, uh, a dipole antenna, and then it bounces off and, and then forms a loop, just like you see in this graph, and then it goes out into the air, right? And there is a kind of a lobe which you show that in which direction that particular, you have unidirectional antennas, you have bidirectional, you have kind of different kinds of omnidirectional antennas, which are kind of sense that waves in all directions. You have these waves which electromagnetic waves which goes through. Uh, there are different kinds of antennas. Of course, dipole antennas are not used today in our mobile phones. We have something called patch antennas. We are now hearing technologies like array antennas, multi-user MIMO antennas. These are more for the base stations. And, and this little bit, which has got modulated into a carrier frequency, which is going at a specific frequency and time, is going as it's getting thrown out through the antenna and in in some of the latest phones is going through two by two mimo antennas where it's taking multi paths so it it may not it may take the same data can go through two paths because if you have a very noisy environment you can duplicate that data and you send it over two paths so that the receiver can get the reflected data coming from multiple sources and extract out that bit you have one options like one option like that then you have they call it space diversity and transmit diversity there's also a way where you can send the data to through paths where you set one set of bits through one you set another set of bits through another and you aggregate them at the other end so what are you getting you're getting double the throughput because you're sending the two sets of data through two different parts. So these are the kind of uh, amazing innovations that are happening. And, and in 5G, uh, in especially with multi-user MIMO, the network is, is now having the ability to create dedicated beams so that the beam will, a specific beam will track the user. As the user moves, the beam is tracking the user and sending the data to that particular user. Unbelievable stuff. So, so, that's, so this is all about how the bit goes through and then do I cover the distance by air for each hop? It's not, it, now it has to cross oceans. A, it has to go through undersea cables. It has to go through optical fiber and most of the cables which we are talking about, uh, you know, even on land, these are all optical fiber cables. You have these QSFP, SFP connectors, which you connect to your, to your servers. They convert them into optical fiber and most of the data goes through optical, uh, optical lines. And there are these huge undersea cables. I mean, there's a nice map here which shows the kind of uh, sea, uh, undersea cables between in between Asia and you and the North America. There are so many of them there. And this little bit, of course, is not the same bit which we started of bit but but that information is now going through the cables and you know having a nice bouncy ride there and i think this is kind of uh, the last part of so and then the same thing happens at the receiving end where the second half of the journey is just the opposite you know the reverse happens the analog signal gets converted to digital the data is transferred trans extracted from the transport channel and then then the last step is of course it has to end up in a display where these data bits are decoded and then they go light up a display and finally you see the black dot re recreated on a display screen and look at it right at a click of a button of a print screen button you have that piece of paper uh, uh, which was there in bangalore uh, available in san francisco so that's the final step so now this is the last slide, which I think uh, I'd like all of us to, um, you know, think about and explore uh, as we uh, go through uh, uh, challenges in future. So let's explore how the next bits to qubits frontier is going to look like. Uh, some of the thoughts I want uh, all of us to kind of use to stimulate our minds is we had a lot of compute in that example. We had a lot of physics in that example. We had a lot of circuit design in that. We had bit handling, error correction, programming. There was a lot of high, I didn't talk about high level operating system, windows and software, but, but there's a lot of stuff there. There is a lot of digital design there. There's, you know, and for all of that, we need compilers, SDKs. How is that landscape going to look if I say that I'm going to be programming quantum computers from now on, which are going to use qubits, which is which is not a classical bit. 
it is a qubit which can represent zero and one with different probabilities. I have to take into account the probability. Is the SDK going to manage that? Is the very log, is the is the digital, is the circuit going to design, take care of that? You know, how is that going to work? Uh, the physics part of it, you know, of course, this is deep technical. I'm not an expert in this, but how are we going to, how is, how is qubit going to be envisioned i know ibm is doing it in one style uh, google perhaps i don't know if google is working on it but every company has their own way of designing a qubit you know some of them are trapped ions some of them are photons electron the, the direction of the electron spin so many ways of of you know bringing that quantum qubit together and some of them i hear it has to work at minus 2 700 degrees to really function as it, as it should really hard challenges out there circuit design we were talking about digital circuit design right it's simplistic flip-flops and gates you know but now we're talking about quantum circuits which has multiple states how how is that going to work? are we going to be using can we use vsdl very log just we use vsdl very log for our hardware design can we use the same thing for qubit perhaps not we need new languages uh, uh, there are like i'm seeing things like q q hash qcl ket i have not had a chance to look at this in because they're extremely complex but yeah is is are these things which we need to build a hello world and see how it works compilers right there are we we are familiar with the high level description language compilers or vhdl very log or for c we have gcc uh, you know so many of these compilers now we are talking about compiling co quantum computing languages i mean i'm and, and there are also sdks i was told there are a lot of sdks already available out there crq qsit cuper these are all sdks out there and how is it going to change the the way we uh, we design algorithms. Will the existing algorithms, uh, you know, uh, will they become irrelevant? Uh, is, is that is that the case, or the same algorithms will have to be ported to uh, uh, to the new SDKs and made to work on the new quantum circuits? Uh, how are we going to be transferring qubits? Here we talk about bits getting modulated as uh, analog waves and sending uh, sending them across. Will qubit also follow the same process? Will it also get modulated as an analog signal and sent across? Or will there be something smarter way to send it? Uh, because we are talking about higher data rates. So, so I think I'd leave, like to leave you with these thoughts and that was probably my last slide and i just like to highlight uh, this talk you know a lot of the inspiration for this talk was uh, the book written by arvind of course uh, he called it the infinite bit and arvind that's the reason i named this <laughs> this talk the life of a bit uh, the the book was focused a lot on digital communication so i just 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 expanded that a bit to talk about you know the the engineering uh, marvels that have been created around uh, around this space and there's also a talk which i have always liked a lot i keep seeing it every every now and then when i need to understand how things work in the browser uh, is 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 about it's called life of a pixel by steve cobes from google it's all about you know google browser it has millions and millions of code and it's it's very hard to go and understand that but what steve has done is that he has explained the life of a pixel that goes from the browser tab and going through the rendering engines of the google and the v8 engines and all of that and going out of the browser it's a fantastic video and that's one of the reasons why i kind of named this one uh, life of a bit as well I'm, I'm 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 sure i've not come anywhere close to the kind of technical depth he covered there but at least uh, felt that. and then uh, to my son of course uh, he's a he's a he's excited about pixel art i mean he uses this tool called scratch uh, which which he learned through some of the courses he attended at ybyte and others uh, where he uses uh, pixels to create art so he's also one of my inspiration and then uh, i use the black dot my i started my career in singapore singapore is called the black dot sorry the red dot you know it's it was given by somebody i think the prime minister of indonesia i think when indonesia was in a crisis 
he was wondering how can a small little dot like singapore survive in an economic downturn what are they doing different and they called it the red dot you know singapore is so small and and this particular example i chose as black dot simply because you know it kind of resonates with my career in uh, and my where i started my uh, kind of career in singapore so that's it um, so thank you happy have a a uh, great engineers day it's coming up and let's keep imagining creating and solving and with that yeah i'm open to having a conversation and yeah any questions thank you sudeep for that uh, very interesting and thought provoking talk a lot of ground to cover so any questions from anyone go ahead Yeah, I think this was a fantastic talk, really, Sudeep. I mean, the way you, you know, uh, the journey of a bit that you took all the way from, let's say, the camera catching it, let's say, the CCD capturing it to reaching the other side. I think really a lot of ground to cover, but very interesting. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anit. Any other questions from folks? Yeah, uh, I have one question. Uh, how can you what right, yeah. are, where to start with to learn about quantum computing and like if you want to learn more about it and explore more about it, like any? Yes, I think uh, one of the starting points. It depends on which domain you work in. I mean, I've I've also been asking the same question to myself, right? Uh, as as we let me, let me go back to this slide, right? Quantum computing is a is is touching pretty much all the fields, right? Starting from physics uh, to circuit design uh, to memory storage, uh, compute algorithm design. Uh, if you are into digital design like Verilog, you know, talking about programming uh, hardware uh, or abstracting it and you know making it um, uh, a software level then there is you know how, how how from a software perspective how do we leverage because software also things in terms of bits generally i mean yeah software is not really bits it's in terms of variables but eventually it's getting you know translated into bits when it does the compute so it kind of depends on um uh where which domain you're working on and then using that as a starting point to do a deep dive that would be uh, one of the easiest ways but but having said that um there is a lot of literature uh, available uh, i mean i know most of the big companies uh, like google ibm even even intel uh, they have a lot of information out there and uh, i know google ibm they're all developing a lot of sdks uh, uh, already uh, there are some simple uh, uh, I've tried some circuit designs, which you can try uh, uh, to create some simple qubit based circuits. Uh, so I, I think what I can do is I can share some of the links around, you know, QSET, Cooper, or some of these SDKs. You can start with these SDKs. You can use these these keywords, which I've highlighted. And some of, I think the ones from google are quite nice uh, you know this their their way of uh, presenting these is quite easily understandable just like how they do for some of the others uh, you can um, look at uh, that um, but then yeah it all again it all depends on which area you're coming from because if you are if you're a hardware designer then it, you will rather go into uh, circuit designs. You know, how do you leverage qubits for that? If you're a person from the software side, uh, then you may up level it a bit and say, okay, how do you abstract qubit away from uh, from what you're doing and make sure that this code can uh, run optimally uh, on those SDKs? Uh, if you are a guy who's uh, looking at, um, let's say, you know, deep technical physics uh, stuff like that, then it's really a hot topic one of course for that you have probably have to be working in that kind of industry to be able to understand the you know the the, the kind of challenges around uh, the physics there yeah so 
Yeah, I, I, I guess there's quite a lot of uh, material out there. If you do a quick search, uh, SDKs are easy ones to start with. I'm not saying that uh, you will um, you'll be able to uh, uh, you know get uh, uh, you know a lot of information from one, but yeah, just try around with these some of these SDKs, and there are quite a lot of yeah good papers uh, around basics of Qubit, which which I must admit every time I read it I get lost because Qubit itself can be represented in different ways. So so I'm trying to abstract away, like for example when I try to read it. I just don't bear bother about how the qubit is is is, is going to be uh, implemented, whether it is photons, electron. I don't care, right? As I just step one step back and said, okay, it's something which will give me the ability to store one zero or a mix of both with a probabilistic nature. Okay, now with that, what is that simple hello world I can build, right? So I start with that and see how it goes. Got it. Thank you. Actually, Sudeep, I have a follow-up question to that. You know, yeah. Uh, what kind of like realistically in practical terms, like what kind of timelines do you foresee for you know us to move so-called away from bits or say start dealing, let's say, with qubits as the regular fair, let's say? Yeah, I well, some companies are heavily investing in this. That's that's all I can say uh, in terms of um, uh, SDKs, hardware. And even providing uh, uh, access to uh, people to run those SDKs on that hardware. Uh, but I think, from a productization perspective, I think it's very far away. Uh, it's not going to be, I mean, I would think maybe 10, 20 years is what I would imagine. Uh, but I think, um, you know, I always take the analogy of. Uh, how Android made its mark in the mobile world, right? Uh, the mobile world always started bottom up, right? We are we're focusing on algorithms. We're focusing on complex uh, stuff, which is where most of the key thing is, right? I mean, uh, uh, algorithms, how do you solve problems, their interface protocols and stuff. But the guys who built Android, they just abstracted themselves away and they said, okay, something is going to be available at, the, uh, at that interface. And they started building the UI framework from the top. And I'm, they, they said that, okay, once I get this data rate, once I get this thing, I can start building user experiences. I can start doing that. And they started working on that. You, and they started building their own SDKs. And, and of course, with an assumption that there will be some sort of an abstraction layer, which will take care, which they can fix later. And I think at some point in time, you know, it it just blended in, right? Uh, yeah, Google came, acquired uh, Android, and they said, okay, we're going to go bring it into mobile, and that marriage happened. Now, I think something similar is likely to happen where people will start envisioning the the power of what qubits can bring, right? What 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 is what what it can enable in terms of uh, speed, parallelism, uh, what are the challenges that are coming? Maybe since it's all probability based, what kind of error correction methods, algorithms would we need? People will start working on that, I believe, using the existing SDKs and maybe start trying it out on some hardware which is available around the world, which which may or may not work as expected. But, you know, uh, I think that would happen uh, in the next 10 years for sure. In, is my my view. I'm not I'm not sure, but I think that would happen. Uh, but yeah, from a productization point of view, yeah, I think it's still far away. But you know, we, if somebody comes up with a smart solution in between, then you know, <laughs> that's the magic <laughs> that as Elon Musk says, right? If somebody comes up with that magic and said, hey, here's what I have, which is you know fitting into a form factor of a of a of a desktop, okay, there you go. So then you have something to play around with. Yeah, thanks. I guess I mean the other thing is it may render some of these existing stuff quite useless, right? Especially encryption and stuff, right? Whatever we are doing today, I mean breaking prime numbers, for example, <laughs> may become much much easier, right? Then. <laughs> so <laughs> those are the challenges. I I think I read yeah. somewhere that uh, for a for a currently our, our, uh, if you want to do some computations like getting prime numbers and stuff like that, a digital computer will take 
millions of years to do it but a quantum computer can do it in a you know a few days or something like that i read some article some something like that and and i i and you're right uh, encryption decryption algorithms all of that will have to be redesigned uh, once this level of compute arrives and, and also at the same time i think it's all also about uh, qubit itself has a weakness oh, i don't know if it's the right weakness the right word is it's because it's based on superposition and uh, entanglement i am also trying to understand what it means it's very hard but but it's there's a lot of probability angle there right so it it can be one or zero based on uh, so now you are uh, you are going to be using that probabilistic nature for your uh, design of course it will get abstracted away for the software guys or for the, uh, the people who build applications but somewhere in the middleware or somewhere in the lower layers that part has to be you know kind of um, dealt with and you know so that you have a deterministic way of programming and for that maybe there are some algorithms and techniques which would come in uh, based on certain measurements and stuff like that yeah Anyway, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, this talk, I would say, is more um, kind of just to stimulate the thoughts. I, I'm not an expert in this domain, so, <laughs> but I thought it's a, through this um, uh, session, uh, you know, perhaps the next big frontier for the next, uh, let's say, next hundred years, uh, which may, which we may come to, uh, it's something for us to uh, start exploring. <laughs>